News Watch Oklahoma is on time for a change. Great to have you with us. And I've got a murderer's row tonight. I mean, an absolute murderer's row of news makers, analysts, uh, and me. It's good to have you with us. Like from right to left, I'm, the way I'm looking at this, Ryan Welton, the chief of digital content at Griffin and the guy behind the curtain. You know about him. Storm Jones and Barry Mangold with big news today. Good to have all three of you guys on tonight. Let's start with Ryan Welton. Let's start with you because we have a little thing called uh, Twitter and this sale today that it's got all the financial networks losing their mind. I'm not sure different parties are losing their mind watching Twitter. So that's kind of fun, but let's just start with uh, get to the point early on is you've been saying for some time that Twitter was like down the list and in terms of importance for people that are getting news and influence, uh, especially marketers and advertising, their advertising stuff is not, not great as you know. So Elon gives a bunch of money. They he's got Twitter. It's going to go uh, private. My question to you is: Is it going to make any difference in terms of people absorbing news? Right. So I think it's actually pretty good for news. It's just in terms of like broader influence. Understand, Facebook has two billion monthly users. TikTok has just about two billion monthly users, and then you have Instagram. Uh, YouTube has two billion monthly users. Twitter is rocking about four hundred thousand a month. Um, it's just not, it's not in, in the same, just not in the same. And I say 2 billion, it may be 2 million. BM doesn't really matter. Twitter's about one sixth the size of these other platforms. However, it's where journalists live. It's where sports fans and athletes live and it's where politicos live. So it's, it's a big deal in terms of that small sphere of influence. And I think today's sale is a big deal for the platform. You know, we were talking before this, what is Elon's, grand master plan and i think that we have to acknowledge that he's got a vision that a lot of us don't have i mean i thought about on the way home i said are we going to be talking to myself are we going to be driving or not driving cars just riding in cars in 20 years how weird is it going to be to say i used to live in an era where there were drivers of cars i think he's just he's a different breed of cat as dean blevins likes to say sometimes and uh you know i think he's he's got his work cut out for him I mean, the joke has been that he wants an edit button but I really think he wants to change the narrative, not about free speech, because that's the entity that's upheld by the government. I think he really wants to change the narrative about what he would consider to be open discourse. And whether it means that he thinks that conservatives have gotten a bad rap, I don't really know. But he is just wanting to bring transparency, transparency and authenticity or authentication to the platform. Can I ask one question? Because I know Barry and Storm have questions, but one of the things that I was seeing him talk about was this making sure things are genuine. I've seen men and women on Twitter, they'll have a million followers. You're like, are you kidding me? I mean, people were buying followers and it was just silly. Right. And so you see this all the time. And it was, and of course, that's number one. Number two is that the blue check crowd's losing their mind tonight, especially on the left. They're just losing their mind. And, I, and I'm going, what is, what is the sort of signal that Elon Musk has sent to liberals in this country that they're so upset with what's happening? Well, I think uh, perhaps in Elon, they see uh, baby Trump a little bit, a strong man, a guy who's going to try to go into the company and tell everybody exactly how things are going to be done. But if, if I may, just to back up to the, the blue check crowd part of this, because one of the things I was wanting to say tonight was to talk about the, the actual process to get a blue check. Um, I actually got to work with human beings at Twitter. I was in communication, not with a help desk, but with actual people who worked up the ladder in Twitter to get the News 9 and News on 6 journalists and anchors and meteorologists verified. And it was a process. It's a lengthy process, but it's transparent. And ever since Jack resigned, uh, it's become even more transparent. And I, I'm not saying that there was a, a quid pro quo there or a cause and effect. However, um, you don't have that with Facebook or with you. Well, YouTube's actually pretty good. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, actually getting help from an actual human being. It's hard to get that at a department store. Um, and the reason why I mentioned that specific process is not to humble brag that we all have blue checks. It's just to say that they actually care about journalists. It's, it's important to them. And authenticity right now before pre-PE, pre-Eon, uh, is important to make sure that 
people on Twitter are who they say they are. I guess my only gripe with Twitter over the years is that it's allowed too much room for anonymity um, and that it's not clear whether or not the person is real or, as you said, a bot with a million <laughs> followers who aren't real either. And, and, and to actually just sort of like segue into the part, I think, again, uh, where people on the left are going to be particularly anxious uh, over the next few weeks is or questions like, will he allow President Trump to return to the platform? Um, is it going to be a, a situation where um, there he relaxes controls over things like doxing? So I, I think there are some legitimate concerns from the left, but uh, I will tell you, I don't think Elon sees it like that. I, I think he has sort of a utopian vision for what the platform could be. Hmm. Scott, I think you're muted. Yeah. No, that was ventriloquism. Oh, that's exactly what it is. So, in other words, I'm still going to be able to find Barry Man Gold in that storm, Jones. I mean, there's no question there. But they're not doing any, you know, not not trying to be anonymous. You're talking about people that were hiding behind their right tag. Or maybe it's call it. maybe it's in the name of whistleblowing. Maybe it's in the name of marketing, um, uh, and maybe it's just in the name of hucksterism or or, or propaganda. I mean, the Russians 100% were using Twitter to manipulate things from 2016 on uh, to, to so uh, to so division. Um, you know, disinformation is probably uh, the biggest problem we have on social media right now. And all of this underscores why it's important to actually be watching local news, reading your local newspaper, tuning into News 9 and News on 6 at night. Uh, and, and getting what you can from Twitter, whether it be Washington Post, New York Times, local newspapers across the country. Um, so what he's able to do in terms of authenticating people beyond journalists, that's left to see. Yeah, I uh, I faced my biggest beef with Twitter was in college. I got actually locked out of my Twitter. I got suspended from Twitter for a year and a half because they thought I was younger than 13 years old. I was a 20 one-year-old junior in college at that time yeah. uh, i had to send them a picture of my id my driver's license like to them and i thought that would get me verified because i sent them a government form of id for a social media app but you emailed somebody your id that's not very good for your online security storm <laughs> it, was app, it was in the app and then i got it back a year and a half later and uh any but, but my thought was i guess my that's question story, though who the um who the community is on twitter after the change like you mentioned those numbers ryan that's smaller than facebook and some of the other platforms but how many of those people you know are there because they like the way it is they kind of like their echo chamber and where they feel comfortable. right well that may be the precise source of the discomfort yeah. uh, among liberals is that uh, all of a sudden you know if uh, a former president trump is allowed back in It'll be sort of a oh we're going to have to deal with that again on, on the platform and I you may have just nailed it to be honest but I guess that's why when it's a private company I guess it's a business decision because they're thinking maybe for all the people they lose they'll get some from the other side well and I think that's where uh, his biggest challenge is going to be because I don't think you can go into a company uh, with hundreds perhaps thousands of developers maybe all who lean a little bit to the left. You're not going to be able to just go in and tell them what to do and, and just expect them to walk in lockstep with you. I think he faces a real big challenge in terms of his internal communications. Hmm. Does he come in there with a, an iron fist or does he bring an olive branch? Oh, boy. Can I ask uh, real quickly in terms of the things, as you say, Ryan, are the most influential and in Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all these one of the things that has happened in the last year is we saw the clubhouse come out and then Twitter followed with spaces. And I think you were telling me the other day that LinkedIn is about to start some audio uh, channels, maybe a couple of others. I've enjoyed spaces. I mean, I'm and golly, you wouldn't be surprised what they're talking about on spaces today on Twitter, but audio is a big deal. It's a big coming deal. And I'm just wondering how you think that affects the audio space. Um, well, it, I don't know what Elon's vision for that is. I would imagine there will be more offerings from Twitter and probably things we haven't even thought of. But audio is a big deal because people still ride on subways and buses and planes and like to listen to something without being 
encumbered by watching videos. So I think it'll still continue to be a big deal. But I, I would just say that for all of the uh, concern that folks may have about what he might do or who he might let back in, he's liable to come up with two or three really brilliant ideas that will probably surprise us. Self-landing rockets will be next. You know that's coming. <laughs> Well, we don't. What I was going to say is we don't need the radio. If the cars drive themselves, we can watch the screen. We can take a nap, you know. Hey, and, he, and I know we. Uh, Welton is he this? He's always hands off on Monday night. He goes, you know, Mitchell, you bother me on these streams all the time. And it's Monday night is sacrosanct. I'm trying to bug, especially after you guys worked all weekend. But um, my question to you is, what are you going to look at over the next week, Ryan? What What are the you know, right after he installs Jack Dorsey back as the CEO. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's say that I'm his uh, communications chief. You know, I've, you know, I've, I spent a few years in, as in corporate comms. My first conversation with him is going to be, how are you going to communicate to your employees? I will tell you for most businesses, their real customer isn't their customer. It's their employees and the communication should be as such. I think those employees at Twitter are concerned. Uh, and I think he needs to be, uh, uh, open to a very open dialogue with him and listen to his employees to see what their concerns are uh, and be ready to not take a hard line approach with them. Because over the next week, the thing I'm looking for is how does he communicate with the employees who are there right now? And he's going to be asking them how we make money. All right. I mean, it's really, the platform is not a good money maker. I, I don't even know that that's his motivation. I really don't. I've got to tell you, I think he'll be public again in six months. I, If I were a betting man, this won't be as much of a failure as CNN Plus. Woo! But I think, I think he'll be out within two years. I think he'll be done with it. I think this is going to be a headache for him that he, he just is not anticipating. Could be. He'll be hanging out with Chris Wallace. Chris. Oh, 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 poor guy. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I just did it. I couldn't help it. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan Welton, the chief of digital content at Griffin. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. You're very welcome. Have a All great right. show. See you later. Okay. So there you go. That's, I mean, this is the best guesses or who knows, right? That sort of thing. So let's get into the new, the Oklahoma news, which I'm really looking forward to. Let, let's start with Mangold because I think when I uh, saw your story this evening, uh, I'm just, and by the way, we were there at Swadley's, what, like two weeks ago, I think, or something along those lines. But Yeah, I was there like a couple months ago. Yeah. Okay. What, what burger did you have, by the way? Uh, I got, it was not the Winchester. I got, I think I got the, ch like, chicken, fried chicken burger. I think I got a fried chicken sandwich, something like that. And, uh, yeah, I, I honestly, I just remember, like, everything I tried was good, personally. This is personally, I, everything I've heard from the folks who've gone there, that's, they either say pretty good or really good, just a little overpriced. I haven't heard anything bad about the food, but there's a whole lot more to talk about. Hey, you hadn't talked to me yet. Well, well I'm just kidding. kidding. Okay. So um, I had the Winchester. I even got a picture of it. All right. And then I think Candace had the Bell Star. It's not bad, you know, but I mean, five guys at expensive burgers, right? So yeah. it's not that big of a deal, frankly. I just, are you starting to see with this that perhaps maybe where the, Everybody's retreating to their corners before the next big round. I can't imagine the lawyers not getting into this big time with this Swadley's termination today. Oh, I think we've we're we're months into lawyers being involved, Scott. I uh, I just know that the at this point this is a no longer a under the nose or kind of hidden, maybe not hidden, but just not extremely public. Like I don't know. I can imagine not a lot of people in Oklahoma are following loft meetings, the legislative office of fiscal transparency. Those is like a, that is a legislative body just dedicated to studying and, and analyzing state spending in different agencies and departments. And that happened on March 31st. And it's been a long month. Uh, see, cause since that came out, it has been uh, a pretty public, uh, a public onslaught of questions and critiques over the invoices and charges that Swadley's has issued to the state. And uh, just to kind of back up and kind of add some context here, the years ago when uh, when Jerry Winchester took over the Department of Tourism, the the goal, as as Kevin Stitt has told him, it, or as Kevin Stitt said, he told all of his department heads to go out and be a top ten uh, agency. And for uh, tourism that meant getting more tourists in and 
this happened, mind you, in March of 2020. March 4th of 2020 is when the state signed this contract with uh, Swadley's. That is mid-pandemic. That is beginning of the pandemic. So as that happens, the state is trying to get more tourists into state parks. They uh, kind of give uh, just a kind of a, I don't want to say a blank check, but they definitely give a lot of, uh, a, a, they just allow Swadley's to kind of engineer and design these uh, massive renovations at these lodges at different state parks, which were in not good condition prior to that. Jerry Winchester said in the loft meeting, one soundbite that I continue to kind of pull in reference to is he said these restaurant spaces, which are owned by the state, were operated by the state prior to Swadley's coming in. And he said they are the kind of operations they operate at a loss. Wouldn't be bet? Wouldn't it be better? This is the quote we got in front of me. Would it be better if we're going to lose money on it that we lost it on good food and good service? Because the goal was tourism. The goal was was to make the places more attractive because they had a very dismal view on them prior to that. They uh, the State Department of Public of Tourism or the uh, yeah the Department of Tourism and Recreation was asking for a huge increase in their budget to. Uh, this past or for this coming uh, year or budget year, because they said the state parks have been neglected. They need more funding. We need an increase. Uh, they, we need a significant increase for the next 10 years to catch up. And of course, loft and state lawmakers had huge issues with that because not only did they want an increase, but they also had questionable spending that they wanted to review. That being this deal with Swadley's between March of 2020 and December 2021, less than two years, SWAT, the state had uh, paid uh, just, I think it was $16.7 million to Swadley's to renovate six, uh, renovate and, and, and improve six different facilities. And that, that's, uh, you can do the math on how many that is per facility. Somewhere in that brisket. Way. It's a lot of brisket. It's a lot of brisket. <laughs> and, uh, and I know, and, and it's it, just looking through a, w the other day for uh, the last story that we did on this, I got a copy of all the invoices. And there, there's there's a lot to go through. I haven't been able to go through it a lot, but it's it shocked me how at the there are some with invoices with no receipts attached, and a lot of them have these just the the issue that they have the we, we bought X Y Z we charge this for labor for X Y Z whatever it always ends with a management fee at the bottom. So the deal that Swadley's had was they were guaranteed to break even. The state promised to to cover any operational costs. The state also promised to pay monthly management fees on top of this per facility. And towards the end, kind of as they, they didn't start with six facilities, but they ended with that. Towards the past last few months, it essentially ends up being about a hundred thousand dollars per month in management fees, give or take. And so, on top of those two things, they also have uh, are able to just reimburse and and and. Uh, and they're also able to charge the state for improvements and renovations to the facility. And on top of those reimbursements, there are management fees and consulting fees on those individual items. So there are just a number of different ways that this was a sweet deal for Swadley's. And the, Jerry Winchester at that uh, at, before state lawmakers, he said that they were going to have a lot of trouble finding operators for these state parks and and that's okay. They kind of landed on Swadley's and he didn't really give a clear answer when representative uh, Martinez asked if he ha asked how many companies got this offer before Swadley's took it. And <laughs> director Winchester just really emphasized that they didn't think that it was that sweet a deal. When if you're a restaurant operator and they tell you, Hey, we'll guarantee you break even and pay you on top of it. That's as sweet of a deal you can get in the restaurant industry. And um, not that I have personal experience, but I, I just kind of, that makes sense to me. So that is it, now that it, it, this was an abrupt end to that deal. It was supposed to last five years. Goes it was supposed to go to 2025. It did not make it to 20 uh, halfway through 2023. Just over two years. About uh, what's it called? Yeah, about two years, almost two months. And yeah, now it's uh, questions of. It's funny that the director of tourism it has a cheeseburger named after him, but now that there's a criminal and state uh, criminal investigation by the OSBI and the state audit, the questions are: All right, how well did Jerry uh, Jerry Winchester know Brent Swadley and uh, the folks at Swadley's going into this? What are the relationships? What were the, what was the context? I, I can imagine that's going to be a focus for investigators. Hey Barry, when you say the state had this agreement, who is the state? Who is is it that? The, 
That is the Oklahoma Department of Tourism and Recreation. Wait, did, did, the, did the lieutenant governor have to sign off on this deal? That was, that's my question. As Secretary of uh, Commerce and Tourism. My, no. Uh, and nowhere on the documents has, uh, is Lieutenant Governor Pinnell mm. it, it signed off or agreed to it. He is he does appear he, he was he was the secretary of commerce just how kind of ryan walters is an advisor in the education realm lieutenant governor matt pinnell is an advisor in the tourism realm and but ryan walters has to sign off on contracts over twenty thousand dollars with the department of education ah interesting i uh, I, I will i'm going to do a double quick double my check. understanding I, i'm uh i'm going to do a quick double check here but i last time i checked i did not see uh, uh matt pinnell's name over and I could be wrong on that. I was yeah. just curious. I was asking you because I was genuinely curious. I saw Lieutenant Governor today saying that he stands beside, you know, behind uh, this break in the re relationship. But I was just wondering yeah. if he had reviewed that as in his role as Secretary of uh, Commerce and Tourism. He was very quiet and very silent on talking about this up until today when the state ended the contract. He was actually, uh, he and his spokespeople have uh, very much insisted on not commenting on this, even when he was at News 9 on a different story for a different interview. We tried to talk to him about it, and he was a hard no and a hard pass on commenting. And the, by the way, the only signature on this, co on this uh, contract is uh, Director Jerry Winchester. Mm -hmm. uh, but both Winchester and Pinnell did appear in promotional videos for Swadley's Foggy Bottom Kitchens, uh, including one for just Swadley's employment recruitment in general. So they were certainly friendly and the state never raised an issue with them appearing in Swadley's videos while promoting these. So, and I, I know that Pinnell and Pinnell was more public about his support and his encouragement of tourism. He is that's his job. That's his job, right? So it's uh, so with the major uh, restaurant operator coming into state parks, they're trying to rev up state parks. That that was a big uh, a, a big moment of hype, I'm sure. It's less. Uh, it, it's not so hype now. Yeah. Could I? I saw some statements today, Barry. Walk me through them because then I sure. we saw the loft report, and then there was those hearings at the state senate, which was cringy, and then you have. Uh, kind of a change today where it looks like, as, as I recall, there was one statement saying, well, we were looking at this way back in the fall, which that, seems interesting because yeah. that didn't come up in those hearings, as I recall. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question because the department in their notice of uh, termination today, the Department of Tourism said that uh, I'm, I'm going to try to find the line here because you're absolutely right that it kind of referenced that's like, hey, we, we it, we've been investigating as long as 2021, uh, and I believe that was that was in the actual statement, not the termination letter. But uh, either way, yeah, you're actually I, you're right that all I know is that uh, one month ago today, Jerry Winchester was defending the contract with Swadley's. In it's terms a timing of, issue, right? In terms mm -hmm. of what an internal investigation was aware of or looking into, I couldn't tell you, but I know that. Last or just uh, about a week and a half, two weeks ago, uh, that's uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago, we got a second request for an investigation by DA David Prater. Oklahoma County DA David Prater has been really the instigator for the OSBI. He, not really. He has been the instigator for the OSBI investigation, as well as the forensic audit by the state auditor and inspector. He has requested both. He has asked that they cooperate as necessary. And he is the one that said that the allegation, the alleged conduct of defrauding or overcharging the state has resulted in $4.5 million in excessive payments to Swadley's by the state of Oklahoma. So that how long D.A. Prater has been aware of this and how long uh, that, that how long he's had an idea of the allegations. Uh, that I, I couldn't tell you the internal audit. I uh, the the so just to make sure I don't get lost here. There's the OSBI audit. There's the OSBI investigation, the state auditors forensic audit, and the Department of Tourism has said that there is an internal audit going on, and that is separate from the two that get get headlines. And if I look at their statement. They had, the Department of Tourism said in early fall 2021, the department initiated an internal investigation. It didn't seem that way when I was listening to Jerry Winchester in the loft meeting. Personally, I'm not sure what they might have been aware of, but it's uh, 
it's all coming to a head now. Safe to say with today's letter saying that uh, where Jerry Winchester himself told uh, told the uh, told Swadley's that they strongly expect the audit and investigation to uncover uh, that Swadley's. Oh, let me, I don't, now that I'm quoting, I just want to make sure I get this right. But it's uh, essentially saying that Jerry Winchester saying that he strongly as strongly expects for there to be some discovery of wrongdoing, whether by mistake or fraud mm -hmm. on the part of Swadley's. That is that's the scene at this point. Which is totally on brand for politicians at a time like this. I mean, Two months out from uh, right. the primaries here. Yeah. And so the thing about it is, is that for old heads who've been around a long time, that first off, this is not on brand for Swadley's. I mean, Swadley's has been, and they're just getting killed right now. Okay. Their brand mm -hmm. is getting killed right now. They have been one of this community's biggest philanthropic groups. They've done stuff for people, injured athletes. I mean, Brent Swadley and these people have done amazing work in this community. I, I just see it in, in the press. Okay. The things that they've done over the years, it's very on brand for tourism to be screwing things up. I mean, when you look at the last, what's well, not been four years, I don't think whenever we have saw a storm, you may have been on boarding at that time, but we had a, a tourism director. that was an executive there a, a few years ago under oath in front of legislative hearings. So you remember that's right after the health department thing happened. Well, then they had these hearings and they were, they were under oath and you had some of the people over at the department of uh, tourism going, well, they were being mean to me. It was a fiasco. It was terrible management at the time. Well, that all went away. So it's, it's odd. The timing of these statements is odd. Um, what the guy said in front of the Senate just right now, it just looks like what you just said, storm. I see a lot of primary election happening here. This is the sort of thing that can derail a lot of campaigns. Oh yeah, I can. And, and, and we were talking about Mr. Swadley. I mean, non-doc, we praised him last time I was on here. Non-doc does great work on this sort of thing and has, you know, video or, or has comment from Mr. Swadley saying he has a line direct line to the governor's office. Those are not the kinds of comments you want coming out. And of course, this isn't a supplier of, you know, uh, this isn't a back in back of the house supplier. This is a brand people see on every corner across the state. My, I mean, I think obviously the elections can be the impetus for this kind of stuff to bubble up. But if it's a bad deal, it's a bad deal, regardless of why they're talking about it now, in my opinion. Hey, uh, Barry, real quick question. Yeah. Have you seen the contract between the state and Swadley's? Is that public? Yeah, I, I requested it from the Department of Tourism. I have it up and I can have it up in front of me. Has um, my question would be, it'd be interesting to see a lawyer or two take a look at that and just see how tight that was. Mm -hmm. Because of Swadley's, I mean, the obvious question would be if they were not being fraudulent or a, another lawyer comes along and he goes, well, that they're taking advantage of that. I mean, there's all kinds of gray areas here Right. where one person's fraud could be, no, man, we, we may have been getting a lot of money out of this deal, but you guys signed the contract. That's right. Yeah, and absolutely right. And this is a, 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 a absolutely a, a pretty sweet deal. I, I mean, the tour, it's it's like I there are two two times where there were extensions of the contract, and one of them exp, uh, explicitly, or I would say extensions, but addendums to the contract. One of them explicitly issues a uh, a, a two hundred thousand dollar back pay in management fees. Uh, it, something like uh, some uh, two million dollars it's two point something but yeah it's there there's these are this is written down in a lot of cases this is definitely in the ink in, in a lot of it there and and i i'm not going to speculate as to any criminal investigation or anything like uh, any allegations but man this is this is a deal that made just the the context of it in 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 and of itself the basic description of like oh we're paying for their losses and we're at paying management fees on top that had a lot of lawmakers going like wait really like we we did this this seems like we're asking them to lose money so it's the the essence and the the very context of the the contract itself had a lot of people questioning what what is the point of this and, and what what is the perp this is not a very financially attractive contract from a state's perspective that doesn't mean that anyone did anything wrong necessarily but like you said was it a good deal that they took advantage of it's very possible was there anything beyond that i'm i'm not an auditor i'm not a cpa i'm not going to tell you that but it's um 
But yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's certainly, and I do want to just make sure I, I for, remember this. We did also get a statement from Swadley's around 4:45. They said they were alarmed and dismayed from today's uh, cancellation, and that they uh, they they say they've accused us of fraud. Uh, the states accused us of fraudulent activity without offering any evidence to reinforce that accusation or a chance to defend ourselves. As a result of the decision, we will be forced to eliminate the positions of close to 300 employees. Uh, and we are heartbroken for these employees. We'll continue to defend the quality of our uh, defend the quality of our work against these unfair attacks on our business. Just want to put that out there because we've been talking about this a lot. So they put that statement out. Uh, the the first statement that I had ever seen from Swadley's about this whole deal came out last week, and that was after the Loft report. That was weeks after the loft, after the Loft report. I, I know that the Oklahoman and the front and frontier had been and non doc, like you said, had kind of been uh, they, they had more direct lines to Brent Swadley or to people right under him. And they had more comments from him uh, or than what was going on their Facebook or what they were putting up publicly. But safe to say that uh, Swadley's wanted to get this out because they, uh, they had a, cons- a um, PR guy and Alex uh, who I've worked with before and uh, they blasted this one out. So they definitely want to make sure that they are not sitting silently on this one i say they're in crisis communication mode now fair to say if they weren't before is there a, besides the pr guy was there a official named i mean is that statement by the pr guy that statement is by swadley's foggy bottom kitchen that's it no okay. name specifically tied to it okay so um okay well here's what we can do right you know this is what we have to do and people are going to say well, we can't really talk right now but if anybody from Swadley's wants to come talk, no edits, no filter, right here. It's the same way with tourism. I also know that everybody's going to be lawyering up. Yeah, so, go, yeah. and, hey, you, know, you know what else? You know what does have plenty of edits in it? It's the story that I have to do for 10 o'clock tonight, Scott. So you got to uh, get out of here. I got to get out of here, yeah. Scott. I've been. Oh, I'm really I, appreciative of your time. I know you got to get this thing ready for 10 o'clock, which we can't wait. There you go. So, yeah. It's a not big story. They, they, they uh, I knew it pretty early today. I was in the four or five and the 10. And you texted me about this. I was like, hey, this is this is a deal people care about because I think a lot of people recognize that as state parks. The it, This is one thing Swadley says in its uh, uh, statement. This is the last thing I'll say before I go is uh, they've said that they've seen tourism go up at state parks since they started working in, in these facilities. Mind you, again, the contract started in March of 2020 the beginning of the pandemic. I'm not going to say that A led to B or B led to A, but it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it'd be a stretch to say that a new restaurant at state parks in the middle of a pandemic is what made the state parks popular and not the parks being parks. But it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, this is uh, Swadley's Foggy Bottom Kitchen essentially was, came in right as people were starting to explore state parks, right as mm-hmm. people were getting outside from the pandemic. So, it's uh, it's safe to say that this has uh, got a lot of name recognition for folks, and uh, and all of a sudden the stakes are pretty high. A lot of a lot of millions uh, apparently unaccounted for, or not unaccounted for, but questioned right now. So we'll and see you where it ends the, up. And you got to get those restaurants open up. Which, by the way, exactly. me thinks this, just so that you'll know, Barry, just to be helpful on this, what they need to do in that one that's down at, at uh, Beaver's Bend, is just go down to Idabel and f- t- uh, f- uh, find Tab Singleton, they have the b- greatest barbecue um, pitmaster in the state of Oklahoma. Just ask they, Ben Felder. He wrote, he writes about him, right? You would just essentially don't get Barry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just about to say, they're going to be, they said they're going to be trying to get local folks in the restaurants or to handle the park business in the immediate future. Not a lot of details on that whatsoever, understandably at this time, but it's, um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these places are closed tomorrow. Uh, yeah. that, uh, but they were all supposed to be close today. Many will they probably. Had, be uh, I saw like paper and plastic over the signs. They got trash the bags street. over the Swadley signs they, right now. It's yeah. like, go directly. Go directly to Idabel. Hire Tab Singleton. If you can run Emerald Lagasse's restaurants in New Orleans, you can run the one. At oh, yeah, no, I'll yeah. take your word for it, Scott. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Hey, man. It's good to see you. Uh, uh, stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. All right. See ya. Barbecue Barry. Okay. Hey, I, what I want to know too uh, is how other states do this. This would be a good story for someone. <clears throat> Barry, um, forty-nine other states run state parks. Do they run their own burgers? Are they making money? Are they, you know, do they contract it out? 
I think I think that'd be interesting to know. It's you know the hospitality and hospitality industry has got its own nuances. I know that Mr. Winchester was talking about my experience on oil and gas, whatnot. I mean, I'm sure that that he is he's made a lot of money. Great businessman. Hospitality industry is a different cat. You know, sure. it's just a different cat. So I'm really interested in the angle about when the statement's sort of changing and what that's what's in that contract, and maybe have a restaurant attorney or two that understands this really well take a look at those yes yeah. that's, that's going to be interesting maybe some third party objective uh, eyes on that one well yeah. turning to the other most of three entertaining stories of the entertaining day, yeah yeah so i was watching it was youtube was where the state election board today was streaming and then i saw you walk across the room working on a mic in the first 10 minutes there was like a buzz i, th I thought it was Deep state trying to keep me from watching the show. There, I right caused there. that. By the way, they came you down. did. Yeah, it was me. Yeah. Oh man, I thought that we were being. I thought Putin had invaded <laughs> the election board um, feed, but it was all of these uh, these challenges which the election board. And by the way, Paul Zirix, he's just an Oklahoma treasure. Yeah. Right, number one, you got to have. There is no stolen election nonsense with Paul Zirix. Okay, it right. is one of the best run. We may not be top 10 in many things, but we're number one when it comes to elections. And number two, this guy is, I mean, he is Mr. Election and they loves it. He loves it. I mean, yeah. he's passionate about it. And, but it was the first one. Okay. The first one with the labor commissioner and the labor commissioner challenge. And people know my um, affiliation for many years, Leslie Osborne, the commissioner Osborne was a regular your vote counts panelist. And so we've known each other for many years. I've only known, uh, representative Roberts in passing a few times, but he was challenged today. Well, just pick it up from there storm. Cause it's a great story. Yeah. So that was the fourth challenge before, before the election board. And by the way, Scott, they're still going right now. Um, oh, last are? time okay. I checked they're on six, they gotten done with six out of 12 at seven o'clock, 12 challenges across the state. A couple representatives had challenges against them or they challenged their opponent. The ones that I've seen were all successful in their challenges. But on this labor commissioner, um, Sean Roberts had said uh, he was running for Congress, I believe. And then kind of one of the surprise filings, I guess, um, a couple of weeks ago was he filed for labor commissioner instead of uh, trying to get to Washington. And when he filed, uh, he put Sean, the Patriot Roberts, uh, as you know, what he wanted to be identified on in the ballot. And by the way, um, that's allowed to put your preferred nickname or your, your the name you want to appear on the ballot. Joe Exotic, Blake Cowboy Stevens, the senator. Those are names that we've seen. Um, uh, a lawmaker that was there today testifying on behalf of Labor Commissioner Osborne, Chris Kennedy. Chris in his name is Christopher, but he gets to put Chris on the ballot. So we get in today, and this is a two-hour hearing. Um, by the way, uh, Labor Commissioner Osborne, represented by former Attorney General Mike Hunter. First time I'd seen him in a few months. Special cameo appearance, right? That was it. He walked in with the boots and suit, and uh, folks were friendly to him. I mean, obviously, there's a couple of folks there from the Attorney General's office who are like counsel advisors for the state election board. Three-member board, the secretary, and then two lawyers uh, kind of help him out. But es essentially, it was over... This nickname, the the, the Patriot, um, they brought in two um, of his colleagues, Representative Chris Kennedy uh, from Oklahoma City and Representative Gary Mize from Guthrie. Both said, "No, never heard of him being called the Patriot. I don't, you know, I don't know what you're talking about." Um, the other uh, on on uh, Sean Roberts' side, they brought in U.S. Senate candidate Jackson Lehmeyer, uh, Tulsa pastor. Um, said, oh, yeah, every, everyone knows him as the Patriot. And it just kind of it talked and talked and talked it over, and it just kind of gets a little goofy. The, the two pieces of evidence they offered to prove that this is his true and genuine nickname, one was a birthday card in which someone sent him on his 46th birthday, and in it it says, you are the true Patriot. It has a cat on the front of the card, and he's reading it, and he says, happy 48th birthday, you old man. And it's like, this is evidence, and Mike Hunter's involved in this proceeding, and we've got, the other one was an award from the Second Amendment Association, a Patriot of the Year Award. So, um, Representative, or uh, 
excuse me, Labor Commissioner Osborne said that, you know, it, that was just meant to fool voters. This doesn't do any public service. It, it, it confuses them intentionally. And Mike Hunter called it a campaign slogan, putting a campaign slogan on the ballot. I mean, might as well just put fill in this dot with an arrow as your name. And um, I don't know. But ultimately, the board uh, voted two to one to uh, no, no, sorry, it's unanimous, 3-0, to uh, have the Patriot removed, but he can remain on the ballot. Osborne had asked for him to be taken off the ballot, but he actually had to go up there and red ink immediately and cross cross out the Patriot on his form. Um, so that, yeah, that was, was I'd never seen that happen before. It was on your story, which I saw that that happened right there. You, you have to yeah. do this before you leave the room? That was it. Yeah, I guess so. It got testy, too, can't it? Uh, you know, whenever you, they come to the microphone, you say and spell your name, which is pretty standard. Um, Representative Roberts uh, struggled spelling Patriot, which uh, Representative Canada pointed out during part of his testimony. It was just kind of, you know, this is the Lord's work on, you know, these election board folks. You know, it was a two hour hearing over this. Um and that wasn't even the most wild. Th- I mean, there there are wild things. It, it probably was the most wild thing. But there was a possum crawling through at one time, looking in the window. I took a picture of it on Twitter. Inside or outside the building? Outside, looking through the window, this possum was. Uh, there's a good campaign nickname. Yeah. yeah. Then there's a guy up in Tulsa who's going to be uh, on the ballot for House District 79, Melissa Provenzano's district right now. She's a Democrat. Um was con- uh, pleaded guilty in 2009 to two drug charges, possession and conspiracy to distribute, uh, but then got it apparently recently expunged. And when you fill out your candidacy, you have to say you've never been guilty, uh, pleaded or you know found guilty of a felony. So the question is, well, is it, if it's expunged, is he still guilty of it? His quote was, you know, uh, when they expunge it, it never happened. So he even said under oath today that he had never been found guilty of a felony. So he'll remain on the ballot up there in uh, Tulsa. Uh, Stan Stevens is his name. Uh, but I, I kind of referenced earlier, Representative Cindy Munson's uh, opponent uh, showed up and said, yep, I filled out paperwork wrong. I'm in the wrong district. So that was easy for Representative Munson. Uh, Representative Tony Hasenbeck found down from Elgin. Uh, she challenged her opponent's candidacy. The opponent didn't show up today to defend their candidacy, so they're stricken from the ballot. Uh, Representative Hasenbeck now essentially elected unopposed uh, to another term. So, Representative Munson have uh, any other opponents? Yes, she does. Yes, she, she does. And she was represented. Uh, yes, that's right. There were two Republicans running against her, and the one today showed up and said, hey, I'm, I did this wrong. But Munson today was represented by a floor leader, Emily Virgin, uh, as was Jason Lowe, who I do not think we've got to his. Uh, he's being challenged. Uh, Munson was doing the challenging, but uh, uh, Emily Virgin counsel on both of those. So it was just an interesting day in this little room and folks fired up, man. OK, so I was, I've seen your story and I was reading uh, Savage's story and Nod Dog. I can call him Savage because I know him first of all. Okay. And I'm reading the part about to where Kennedy was testifying. It's the worst secret in the world that Chris Kennedy does not like Sean Roberts. Okay? Correct. And I think that one of the one of the words that was used by whoever wrote the story, I think this is a uh, Trey story. Forgive me. Oh, I think no. it's probably uh I think this is Megan's story. Megan, that's right. Yeah. Megan right there. So the one that I saw early on was talking about Mr. Roberts. Oh, it's old timers. That sounds like a movie title. Anyway, so Mr. Roberts, they I, it was either Megan or Trace wrote was lurking around the basement last week. Used the word lurking, and I'm like, okay, it's descriptive. It's interesting. around what basement? Well, I guess the other day during filing. Oh, it's lurking around during the filing time before he finally went in and and uh, changed. But then I think people understand there was a an effort by some in the Republican caucus a few years ago to get rid of some caucus members. Ours, about, well, according to Representative Roberts, that charge you're talking about was led by Representative Canada. Yeah, correct. And I think that, as I recall, this is somewhat uh, misty in the time has passed, but I think they got nine out of 10 of them out of there. And the one that didn't get out was Sean Roberts. That's it. And that, that's and it. according to him, that's the origin story of the Patriot. 
Okay. He's the one that survived. Well, I know. And then Chris it goes can... into all this other stuff where Chris Kennedy obviously has a, a, a extensive record serving in the National Guard and tours of duty. And so we got into what is a patriot today and a little bit of, you know, a patriot, someone who serves our country in uniform. And, oh, it was, yeah. Uh, well, I guess it's if it's still going, it's more than likely going to stay on YouTube. That's the way Paul operates. So he started I, another link. There's a new YouTube link on the election board's uh, Twitter account. Um, they said earlier that ha- they'd break for dinner if they have to. This is interesting stuff. I actually, as you know, mind numbing as it is, you're like, it's a little silly. Okay, we can all say it's it's a, it's a nickname. He's still on the ballot. But it, it's one of the more entertaining things I've sat in on a while because folks are fired up about it. And it's how the sausage is made, right? I mean, yeah. there's three folks who are going to decide whether he stays on the ballot or not or what remedy we have to take. So in, in terms of back to the labor commissioner primary, is this is, you know, we see lots of races and insiders know which ones are serious, which ones right. are not. Do does anybody think that Representative Roberts is going to mount? Is he going to have a well-funded campaign? Is it a serious challenge to the labor commissioner? I, I don't think that's been fleshed out. How serious it is? I was. I should have gone back and looked and saw how uh, the margin she won by Osborne did in the last election. Um, there are, are there's Osborne, the incumbent, Roberts, one other Republican, a Democrat, and an, uh, an independent. I don't know. I mean, I think labor commissioner is probably one of those uh, those statewide elected positions that flies under the radar. Maybe the most, you know, uh, uh, smooth sailing uh, elected offices in the country that's or in the state that's inclined um, to reward an incumbent Republican without scandal. I don't know. I don't know if there, there's a grassroots movement. I'm sure Representative Roberts will tell you there's a huge grassroots movement supporting his campaign. Uh, but I just haven't seen that yet. Could be wrong. Uh, isn't it funny how the, the, the news window changes so fast, the cycle a week ago, we were talking about the lead project or project ocean is my understanding. Yeah. I don't know if you made it out there today uh, to the other parts of the building, but my understanding was the governor signed the legislation finally. Yep. That's right. Uh, House bill 4455 lead project. Um, obviously still, they're not saying it, you know, who the companies are. Um, but my understanding was too that the Panasonic board was supposed to be voting maybe as early as early this week. Um, so I, you know, today, even before the Swadley stuff today, people are saying, well, when's the signing ceremony of uh, the lead act? I didn't anticipate one. I think that the ceremony we'll see is Panasonic's coming to Oklahoma. I mean, that's the, that's the big one or the next one, in my opinion. I don't know that saying, Hey, we finalized this offer. I mean, it, we, it, this was kind of inevitable, right? I mean, it passed yeah. a bipartisan, uh, huge majority, and the governor was begging them to sign it. Of course, he signed it. I mean, he asked them for it. Hello. So I think next, we'll, next, if we get a you know a, a press release on this, I, I would expect that it would be announcing they're coming. It's only the biggest economic thing that's ever happened in Oklahoma, if indeed it happens and things continue, which is. If, if you saw the world news, world financial news day, Shanghai is shut down. Beijing's real close to being shut down, which means the Wuhan's and others, their COVID protocols over there. And so just about the time, a lot of us that watch the finances, the financial markets are going, maybe inflation is it's going down from here. It could be a while before we can measure it. But about that time, we see China being shut down. So here comes your supply chain problems. Here comes your electric battery problems. Here comes your microchip problems. So, you know, the world's so interconnected. We can't do what a lot of people, which is want to do, which is just don't forget about what's happening over there. You can't, I mean, we just can't. And so things that are happening on the world stage right now make Panasonic even bigger. If it were to happen now, it's just an incredible thing. Well, it's between, I mean, uh, all indicators show that it's between Kansas and Oklahoma. Uh, the Panasonic deal would be about six hundred fifty million dollars. The lead act was seven hundred, but uh, Canoe will likely get fifty million of that. So we're looking at six hundred fifty million dollars. Um, Kansas's offers for one point three billion, uh, but their facilities aren't site ready. I mean, I've I heard a lot of folks talking about. Um, well, for one, Oklahoma has the cheapest energy prices in the country. That's huge for an electric battery manufacturer. 
Um, and then just the Mid-America Industrial Park up there near Pryor, um, you know, is, is one of the most well-equipped uh, sites in the country to take a project and get it online. And they call them shovel ready sites. And the project managers up there will tell you they can sign something and you can be out there digging the next day. So it'd be interesting. The folks I talked to are pretty confident that Oklahoma coming in at half of the Kansas incentive, the rest of the stuff makes up for it, according to. Uh, to, to lawmakers and, and folks leading the, the LEAD Act, um, pro tem Kyle Hilbert spearheading it on the uh, the House side. Uh, so, yeah, that'll be interesting. I thought it was something Cherokee else. Nation, Cherokee Nation's putting some money into it. So there, there's some other things in Oklahoma. But also the fact that one of Panasonic's customers would be right next door, which is Canoe. Canoe, yeah. And Tesla, a, Tesla, a guy that just bought a social media deal today. So. It's it's really putting together. I, I had uh, one a couple last questions, yeah. and thanks for all taking the time tonight. So we did Beyond the Bell Saturday with um, Senator Stanley, Senator Garvin, and talking about teacher pathways, trying to get more revenue in. One of the things that occurred to me as we're having that discussion was you have these people like if if indeed Panasonic comes to Oklahoma, you could have people bailing out of industries like teaching. To yeah. go do those jobs, right? Yeah. Well, and, and so um, my question to you would be, where do you think we're going to see, you know, the governor started the session out saying, what, he want to do 100K for teachers? And well, I know that you've got a jillion things going on, but my question is, are we going to see a significant teacher pay raise this session? Well, the, 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 it's almost, this sparked two things in my mind, and one of them was the legislative priorities going into this. Remember, uh, there's bipartisan support, support for eliminating the grocery tax. At one time, the speaker was talking about sending out people 100 bucks, you know, an inflation benefit. Those things aren't things being discussed right now. And, and I think I, I heard in the press shop this evening at the Capitol, someone talking about doing that story on, hey, where is this stuff that we were talking about? And so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at the beginning of the session, that's a worthy question of asking about $100,000, a six-figure teacher pay raise, the grocery tax, fighting inflation. How are we doing that with this? Um, the, the, the money that we've given up, I guess, it, it, that, that's a great story, and maybe they're still working on some of those things, but I, it's definitely a worthy question. Um, hey, you should talk to the speaker sometime. Uh, I heard he comes around here once in a while. He does. And we've moved. The reason there's no speaker um, uh, episode tonight is because we're moving his recording time to Wednesdays henceforth. Perfect. Just because of the way the session is going. So I will. And there's in fun. fact, I think tomorrow I'm going to have a video with the speaker about how this all came together, being Project Ocean, at least from the House side. Are you sensing that they're getting along okay? You know, there were some people that were kind of agitated with each other, House and Senate. Um, yeah, speaker in the pro team a few weeks ago, but it's, I'm not hearing any sort of friction talk right now. I'm not either. And frankly, Scott, it seems like a lot of the hot button topics. I mean, there's really not a whole lot left, frankly. Well, that's apparent on the surface. I mean, nothing's ever dead until, you know, May 25th. Um, but there, there's not really con sore points or points of contention that I'm seeing right now bubble up. Whenever I'm frankly, I mean, obviously I, I look at the floor agendas every day to see what's coming up. And they had 40 bills on the, the floor of the House and Senate today. And I mean, for a Republican legislature, it's not things that, I mean, even really trying to explain to folks the substance of these changes, it's not that controversial, honestly. I mean, and I'm sure we have, you know, I'm sure there'll be specific examples of things to specific folks that matter. But, you know, by and large, I'm looking for stories every day that's going to, you know, disrupt things, you know, that, that, that folks are uh, br broad appeal. And those aren't things, you know, it, it's been kind of uh, slow. It's been busy, but kind of slow at the Capitol, in, in, in my opinion, not seeing too many things that have are ruffling feathers on either side. Hey, one thing I want to hop back to on the, uh, the employment side is that Representative Gann, and I'm forgetting his name, his first name, actually represents Pryor in the House and voted against uh, the LEAD Act and debated against it for a long time. And he says folks in Pryor are concerned there's going to be a suck. Employers are concerned it's going to be a suck uh, of their employees who are going to be able to go and, you know, get these well-paying or good-paying jobs. About 4,000 of them is what, uh, you know, the number being floated. 
but that, you know, even within Mid-America Industrial Park, they say there's already, I think the number is between four and 600 job openings already in the park that they can't fill. So some of the neighbors are going to, you know, even get competitive when it comes to these high paying, high skilled jobs. I think on a statewide level, you hear Labor Commissioner Leslie Osborne on your vote counts uh, or hot seat rather um, talking about the way the medical marijuana industry affected entry level jobs in Oklahoma. Forty five thousand jobs came here overnight, making, I don't know, those twenty five bucks an hour, maybe. So folks don't want to work in fast food because they can go make twenty five dollars at the pot shop next yeah. door. This on, a, on another level are the same jobs, smaller pool of people on these, you know, high tech jobs, high skill jobs, um, but per, perhaps the same effect. Exactly. And I know that there's still t I think we're going to be seeing some medical marijuana reform activity this week. That's what I was led to by watching your volcanoes yesterday, the Eccles fellow. But I will tell you this. I mean, I think I saw a sign today or Candace did 18 or $19 at a burger joint mm -hmm. starting right now. So, I mean, it is, I mean, inflation's real and, yeah. but you're, you, that's a story. That's a huge story about the, you use the word suck. Okay. You suck these people out of these industries that don't pay as much whenever the, the weed comes to town and these dispensaries and all that. And the same thing's going to happen at mid America. It just means commerce going to have to work even harder. I mean, they're doing great jobs, but you know, the great, great equilibrium is going to be whenever that, you know, people start moving into those areas where the jobs are, that's going to happen. That's painful and it's slow and all of those sorts of things. I was going to ask you about medical marijuana, but I kind of popped that one out there. I'd heard anything, but how would we have heard anything today? Right? Yeah. No kidding. News from today. I always appreciate you, man. Yeah. It's great to have hey, you on. Uh, tomorrow, uh, and by the way, I've got to mention tomorrow is OU day at the Capitol. Whoops. Um, I, I, I got in a little trouble, um, a while back. Um, like because, last week when you were well, there? I got in trouble multiple times. I committed like collegiate or something last week wearing an OU shirt, but, uh, OSU day was up to the Capitol and the band played and that pistol Pete and all the cheerleaders and, uh, OSU, uh, alumni in the legislature, are a rowdy bunch wearing their, you know, bright orange and they're all out there hooping and hollering. And it's cool. It was cool. I was an OU grad to watch it. I took a video of it. And then I had a couple, I had a lawmaker and a couple, uh, um, sergeants at arms tell me that they said, Oh, you day was yesterday. This was a couple weeks ago. And so I tweeted the video and then I, and then I said, Oh, I'm told, Oh, you day was yesterday. Where, where was it? You know? And, uh, I got an official email from the university of Oklahoma at 7 PM asking me to correct my tweet because, Oh, you day had not occurred yet. Uh, so we're very excited. I expect live ponies in the rotunda. Um, you know, uh, the whole nine yards. See how many people were at the spring football game this weekend? Oh, 75,000, Scott. We all know who's numero uno. Forget about the score last November. Okay. Yeah. The, the By the way, I, we can football. help you. I mean, for folks like Storm, who has friends that go to the Orange School, I mean, there is an Orange School student from this very house, this red yeah. house, forever, goes up there getting a great education. Great. So, you know, it's one of those things where that, we just have to live in peace and harmony. Yeah, you can overcome it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, and the very last thing is that there has been an announcement for people who and Storm Jones never sleeps, and apparently it's not you're not having any sleep is going to get even worse because there's a, an announcement. I don't want to take the announcement myself, but yeah, big changes at News Nine involving Storm Jones. I don't know. I'm I'm not going to sleep. That's the announcement. Uh, I'm moving to the morning shows in June. Uh, starting in June, I'll be anchoring the four to five a.m., um, which I've started watching recently. I've been recording them, so I so I know what the show looks like. Um, I'll be moving to the the morning show, anchoring from four to five, and then I'll do probably um capital related stories in the morning show from uh five and six o'clock uh but yeah getting a little desk time uh, of course augusta will take over stuff at the capital uh colby's moving to an evening show our 4 a.m anchor right now um all kinds of other announcements they're working on but uh no i'm excited about it i get to i get to sit at the desk a little bit and you know maybe some of the snow days i don't have to stand in the snow uh, I, I would like to remind you that, and I, you know, Herms would call and go, I need you out yeah. on the set tomorrow. I'm like getting up at three o'clock, dude. Right. So we do have this, you know, this setup now. So it, I, I'd love to work with you. 
I just don't want to drive in at three o'clock. So to do it on the four o'clock desk, what time do you have to get up? Uh, I'll probably get up two fifteen, two thirty. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm buying a coffee pot with that, uh, you know, with that, that bonus. I'm going to go get a fancy one that turns on and sings to me in the morning. So wait a minute. Don't guys like you don't anchor guys. Don't you have like a limo out front every morning? Like Joe Scarborough yeah. and guys like that. It's going to pull right up, drive you to snow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, I'm going to also have to go get glasses so I can drive at two o'clock in the morning, okay. blinding lights. Oh, what, um, I'll ask Nathan for you. I'm sure that's just. It'll be just like that. Yeah. Cut David Griffin. Maybe Jim can pick me up and put a little helipad out there. Yeah, he would do that, by the way. He would. So I yeah. love Jim Gardner. Well, he's uh he's one in a million and Ward and all those guys that make those things happen. It's it really is true about how many people it takes to get a a, a crew on, get yeah. the show on. I love how is it Friday nights now they show the control room. Yeah. And and I love that. I mean, those people who you know toil anonymously, but ain't nothing happening if they're not right on. No, that's right. It's a huge team sport, huge team sport. Any single person, your mic doesn't come on, your package doesn't get sent in, the graphic doesn't come across. Um, it's a, it's, it's a lot of fun. And there are days obviously when the, 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 you know, well, you mentioned the storm. We had, you know, some couple tornadoes touchdown over this past weekend where all systems are go. Then it's exciting. It's fun to be a part of. And you can kind of, you know, you can kind of get a little addicted to it sometimes because, you know, folks in there uh, maybe are some of the un unseen folks, but they're just as passionate about it as anyone else. Yeah. By the way, that, uh, that one over at Northeast of Jones, that's about 200 yards away. So as we were, Joey and I were standing here going bad decision. Anyway, um, all's well that ends well storm Jones. Thanks so much for your time tonight. We'll be seeing you in June at 4 AM and I hope to see you next week. Sounds good. All right. And, uh, thanks to all our viewers. Thanks to Ryan Welton. Thanks to Barry Mango. Looking for that 10 a.m. package on the Swallies. That is the story that's going to keep on giving for a while, right? Yeah, that's right. I've had folks reaching out to me today. I think these are the stories that once it starts going, more people, more, more, more is coming out. Okay. Well, listen, really appreciate you. We really appreciate all our viewers. There's Julie, Michael, and I see Dr. Sublet. The, the, um, the issue is the glasses and um, the cataract surgery that's upcoming, so I can't read them. But I they say boomer. You. They say boomer. Yeah, they do. They say and I can make out the S O O N E R at the end of it. But thanks, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Julie. Uh, thanks, Sherry and Dr. Sublet, who will be seeing him in a couple of weeks on the Fab Four. In the meantime, Scott Mitchell for Storm and for Barry and Ryan. Have a great evening, everyone.